You did um, Rock the Bells? Mm -hmm. When Rock the Bells came out, I was like, what the fuck is this? You guys don't understand what you were doing to us in Virginia. Let's take a couple of breaths. Okay. <sighs> Thankful to be here. All good. Very. So what you've been listening to lately? Anything exciting? I, I feel like um, there's like a couple songs here and there. But for the most part, you know, I just like to be intrigued. So tell me what intrigued f looks like for you. Intrigued for me is, first of all, this moment is intriguing. Doing this with you right now, that's intriguing. Um, but for me, musically, I feel like I'm not, I'm not one of those guys that are like, you know, oh, this is a 9-8 time signature. This is amazing. That just feels like math to me. I think I get blown away by chord progressions that make me feel something that I've never felt before. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, chords are coordinates. Wow. You know what I mean? They, yeah. like, send you to a place. Beautiful. And uh, when I'm lucky enough to be in the right elevator, <laughs> and I'm looking up, and I'm doing two. I'm doing three things at once. I'm going, what is that? Mm -hmm. Number two, I'm trying to like remember the feeling, because when I go to chase it later, that is, I'm gonna have to reverse engineer the feeling in order to get to the chord structure. Mm -hmm. And third, to just back it up by trying to Shazam it right then and there. How great is Shazam? Shazam is a gift. Yeah, game changer. Game changer. Yeah. So if you find one, what do you do with it? Let's say you, you hear something in that moment, you have that experience, you've Shazammed it. Yeah. Next, what happens? I just want to listen to it over and over and over again mm -hmm. and really understand what I'm feeling mm -hmm. and why I feel that way. Because mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole like university of science between what's being played and what you're hearing. Yes. So you're analyzing yourself as much as the music. Yeah. Because if you don't, then you don't really, you're not really getting the proper assessment of what's happening. You know? Um, if I'm hearing something, but I'm not paying attention to how I'm feeling, then for me, I don't know what I'm listening. That's my way of, that's my GPS of mm -hmm. understanding. That's how I process things. That's how I feel. Mm -hmm. That everything's cataloged by and, and categorized by um, the feeling of it. If I, can't, if I can't see how I feel about it, then I don't even really know what it is. It's just music. So just give me, you don't have to give me a specific example, but what would be the kind of things that you'd be on the elevator that would stop you in your tracks? Again, you don't have to be specific, but how would you describe what you're hearing? I'll take it outside of music terms. It's kind of like being at a table with several people. You're in a conversation with someone, and all of a sudden, you realize you've drifted off in thought, and this person is still talking. You hear their voice, but you now no longer know what they're saying. Yes. Because you don't, you're not connected to, you're not, you're not plugged in. Yes. To the conversation. Yes. So now it's just a bunch of vocal tone. Yeah. That's what it's like. If I'm not, if my feeling is not connected to the song, then I don't really know what I'm listening to. Couldn't really tell you what it was. When you're working on music, with other artists, are you always working on it with them in mind? Or are you working on your favorite music? And then depending on who you're collaborating with, 
it applies to, it may or may not apply to them. I'm always channeling other people. Usually the person that I'm working with, I'm sort of channeling them. Other times I think that they should be channeling someone else. So I'll do that for them. Mm -hmm. And they may not suspect that it will sound good on them. 60% of the time, they don't do it. 40% of the time, people just trust and try it. Mm -hmm. um, and within that 60% of the time, it goes to someone else who absolutely gets it. Mm -hmm. That's how the universe works. Yeah. Like, there are all these triggers and not all of the ending results will be what you think it's supposed to be. It's what, it's what was written. Yes. If you're, um, this speaks a little bit of, to something you just said. If you're working with an artist and you have a difference of opinion with the artist over something you're working on, what, what would normally happen? Oftentimes I take off my ego hat when I'm in the studio. So a lot of times there's this thing that happens where it's like, People respect, for the most part, like sometimes, most, most people assume like people respect others that they idolize. But I found that people, while well, they do sometimes, but I found that people really respect the person that they kind of feel like is the alpha in the in their rapport, in this newfound rapport. But most producers, they kind of like, no, I'm the alpha. Like, you know, you, you know how many yeah. records I've sold. Yeah, yeah. When truth be told, we've not sold anything. We've only made music and people chose to stream it and share it and buy mm -hmm. it, whatever. We're not responsible for it, our success. There's Agreed. millions of people who are responsible. Absolutely. Yeah. But when you do that, like, Oftentimes you run the risk of them just all of a sudden just being like, man, I went from like trembling my boots, talking to my parents about being so excited to be in the room with this guy to like, he, you know, I run the show. And so when we get to that place that you're talking about, when there's a subtle disagreement, this is when I have to, I don't, I still leave my ego hat like hung up at the door. But that's when I say, you know, maybe you should try this. So, you know what, if you do that, it's probably going to be what you've been doing. And my job is to um, nudge you, to poke and prod and pull you in places that you would not go so that you can get a different result. Because if you do the same things, you're just going to make another one of those really well. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's when they have to trust you. And that's that same kind of very subtle trust of when um, someone says, oh, you snore in your sleep, but, you, but you're one of those people that doesn't snore and wake yourself up. You just snore in a certain hour or whatever. You just don't know. Yes. You, you know, it's one of those subtle things that you just got to trust that someone sees something that you can't see. Yes. Um, another example of what those subtleties is like, you hear yourself talk all day and then you hear yourself on a voicemail and you sound completely, completely different and you hate what you hear. Right. But everybody else hears the same thing. Yes. But you hate that. Yes. Well, the difference is, is because we're listening through the cavity of our head. But they're again, these people who don't notice those subtle differences, mm -hmm. they rule that out. So. If they can trust you enough. Yes to know that you can see, hear, or feel something that is way too close for them to discern, then you guys have the ingredients, ingredients for like something new to come. Yes. How, how often would you say that happens? Is it typical on most projects or once in a while or once in a blue moon? Every time I go in with Kendrick, he transforms, but he gets that. He knows he's his next man. He's super clear about that. Mm -hmm. Ariana trusted. Uh, I'm 
Jay-Z gets it. He's always gotten it. I mean, he's, people don't realize he's been making records since the 80s. That's unheard of. What's the first record you made with him? We got a lot of records together. I think it was Give It To Me. Yeah. I think that was the first one. Let's say you were going into the studio tomorrow with a new artist you never worked with before. What would a typical first day be like? Or is there a typical first day? It's what they come in talking about. It's what they happen to be actually going through. So what they're talking about at that particular moment. It's what they happen to be going through. And it's a new way that I can use their voice, like a juxtaposition to what they usually do. Like if we were comparing their voice voices to textures, if they had a like satin voice, what would it sound like against granite versus, you know, cotton? You know, if they have like a crazy like diamond voice, what does it sound like, you know, dropped in jello? Like, how do I mix the sensory? How do I mix the sensories together? Usually when you start a project, do you come in with any ideas or thoughts before it starts? Or do you start with like a blank slate? A lot of times I'll come in with like two or three ideas. And might those be conceptual ideas or tracks? Tracks. Do you make tracks often? Yeah. And do you make tracks regardless of thinking about where they're gonna go? Sometimes I think about where they're gonna go to get them out, to like. Just to make them. Yeah, I have to channel. Yeah. I channel all the time. I'm always pre pretending I'm someone else in order to get it to come out. Cause I just feel like I'm the best version of myself is as a producer is I'm, I'm like a mirror for people. I try to show them sides of themselves that they don't ever use. It's like when people take selfies, they only take like, they only use like one side all the time. So I'm the guy that's like, Hey, you know, God made another side. Like, it's very interesting. You should try it. Let's come up with a hypothetical example. Name an artist you liked from childhood. Someone you listened to as a kid. Can you tell me someone? Stevie Wonder. Okay. So if you were producing a Stevie Wonder album, what would be what's what would be your first instincts in making a Stevie Wonder project that you would want to listen to? What would it be? Uh that's kind of difficult because he's done so many different genres. I mean, his reggae was amazing. His disco was amazing. His ballads were unbelievable. His Parisian, Burt Bacharach, you know, Bossa Nova stuff was amazing. So maybe use some, maybe let's use somebody else. Okay. I guess I only like eclectic people. Because I was going to say Earth, Wind & Fire, but like they did a lot of stuff Evolves. too. Absolutely. I like a couple of non-eclectic groups. I like the Ramones and I wouldn't want them to be different. <laughs> yeah, they were really good at that thing. Yeah, yeah. But more often than not, I like the watching the evolution and growth. Maybe Prince. That's a good one. So what would, what would the Pharrell produced Prince project, what would be different about it? Maybe it'd be interesting to hear him do like Afro-Cuban. Be incredible. Be something else, yeah. It's a great idea. Beyond Stevie and Prince, who would have been the, the music you listened to growing up? Earth, One and Fire. James Brown. Did you grow up in a musical household? They played a lot of music all the time. Brothers and sisters? 
Yes. Music was just like in our environment. It was just like in the environment and like going to church all the time, you mm -hmm. know, like between getting in the car and listening to the music in the car, listening to music at home and at church, like it was always something. You grew up in Virginia? Yes, sir. And what was the music you listened to in the car? What was the station? On the FM side, it was K94. On the AM side, it was AM850. And everything from Rick James, uh, Give It To Me, to Thriller, to Another One Bites The Dust, to Chuck Brown's Bustin' Loose. I mean, it was a wide range. It just... Was there much... Go did Gogo -Go make it to Virginia? Oh, my goodness. Really? Gogo -Go was the second sound of Virginia. Wow. It was everything. Wow. Everything. Do you ever go to the Gogo? -Go? <sighs> Nothing like it. Nothing like it. That's a world. Yeah. And it's so interesting to me because... It's such a pocket that if you go outside of D.C. North, northwise, like to New York, like you wouldn't know anything about it. No. If you go, but when you go down south, you could find some of it in Delaware. You could find a little bit of it in Maryland, but not much. And, and Virginia was just big. And the Carolinas, it was, it was big. It was a world. It's a world. When I first heard it, it completely blew my mind. Completely. It felt like it was the next, like, after hip hop, after the next hip -hop, wave. Yeah. It felt like that. Yeah. It felt like that. Well, you guys produced a lot of records with that sound. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. You did um, Rock the Bells? Mm hmm. Haven't heard it in a while, but hope it holds up. <laughs> That's crazy, bro. I was, I'll never forget where I was when I heard Rock the Bells for the first time. We were over my cousin's house out in Norfolk. And uh, I got a cousin named Fifi. And my mom and dad used to go over to their house over the weekends and like, we would just go over there to play cards. Well, they would go over there to play cards. I didn't know how to. They would play like spades. And... But when Rock the Bells came out, I was like, what the fuck is this? The, 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 cause it was, cause we love Go-Go. Yeah. So it was kind of like these New York guys with this like Go-Go sound. And then like, L was like the coolest. He had the crazy chains. You guys don't understand what you were doing to us in Virginia. It was a whole thing. It was like, you know, you know how bad I wanted a troop jacket? Like how bad I wanted a troop jacket. I wanted that I wanted those chains. The music just literally transformed. It was doing things to our minds, shifting our perspectives making us dance, making us run to the television to watch your MTV raps for a glimpse of anything, yeah. any kind of slang. Yeah. We savored it yeah. because those records were so good. Wow. People don't remember how hard it was to hear rap music. No. It was the underground of the underground. Yes. <laughs> it was a tiny subculture. Really tiny. Yeah. But he's super huge. Yes, but also tiny. Yeah. Like they like they did a lot to try to suppress it, but the white kids loved it too much. <laughs> and there was no hate to make it racial, but that's what changed it, mm -hmm. right? We've been professed our love for it. You guys been making it. 
but you just couldn't, you know, they couldn't suppress that. It just was too big. It was just too strong. It was too beautiful. And it, it was igniting people in a way. Why do you think they wanted to suppress it? They didn't understand it, in my opinion. They didn't understand it. They didn't understand where it was coming from. If you don't understand where it's coming from, you really don't understand why it's necessary to support it. And then like some, a group of people realized there was a lot of money in it. Mm. And then things changed, obviously. Mm. I think it changed for the worse, personally. My, my experience was when people started getting involved, once they saw they could make money in it, yeah, it, it changed the culture a little bit. Sure. Because early on, anyone who was doing it clearly loved it because there was no upside. No. So if you were doing it, you had to love it. Yeah. You just did it because it felt amazing. That's it. <laughs> what's, your, what's your first memory of any hip hop? Craft works. Wow. Interesting. I wouldn't have given that answer, even though probably same. <laughs> but I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We were hearing those records and we were like, what is this? Yeah. Another record that was very transformative in Virginia was um, Strafe Set It Off. Yeah, incredible. One of the greats. Anytime you were at a club and that came on, people just lost their mind. One of the greats. And there's not much to it, if you think back. It's amazing. Yeah. Every sound. Yeah. Every sound in that song. Yeah. That's like what I was like trying to beat. Um, when we did Grinding, I was like trying to beat like the classicness of like Set It Off. Yeah. I mean, the Benjamins is what sent sent us in the studio. Like, okay, we gotta like, we gotta beat this. Yeah. But set it off was like, set it off was a hit for like eight more years. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You can go out to a club today and still hear it, and it would play like it played the day it came out. Starts with one snare. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was, as a kid. There was nothing like coming outside, somebody pulling up like, you know, their car or whatever. You come outside and like one of the drug dealers is like, you know, they have the system like just knocking and they're playing set it off and they all just sitting around like smoking a joint. And you're just like, wow, these guys are tight. I mean, that's how we looked at them. They were like yeah. larger than life. Yeah. I mean, every time you came outside, you know, the gold chains or whatever, whatever, and the music's playing, those are videos. At least that's how I was looking at it. I, we would just go outside and be like, wow, we're losers. <laughs> well, what are we gonna do today? Let's go lose. We just walk outside and you just see like the baddest chicks, you know, the hoop earrings, the, um, bicycle shorts, you know, with the incredible figures talking to the drug dealers. And those guys are all just like, you know, chains out, passing joints, and set it off as playing. And it's a movie. Another record to me that is like, had like an eight year run, White Lines. Yeah. How do you just like, how do they just like nail each one of Planet Rock mm -hmm. numbers, set it off, and white lines, and, uh, and um, the message, mm -hmm. each one of those records. So my question is like, how, like, what were those guys feeling? What was Grandmaster Flash and Melly Mel feeling when they made the message? I might argue Scorpio, for that matter, is up there. Scorpio. Yeah. When Scorpio. I was DJ and I would always play Scorpio. Did you, did you do that record too with L? Uh, I don't know. 
The, the um, Jingling Baby. No, that's after me. Okay. Yeah. Because that's what they sampled. Oh, is it? Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, that was a record. Yeah. So cool. That's like. <laughs> Music was a different kind of eclectic then. Any theories why? Technology where it was where it was. Instrumentation was still very much so a very big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of predictive um, default modes in, in the way that people program now. Mm -hmm. Like, so you don't have to play as much as you can. You know, it's perfect for someone who um, is a great player or someone who's not the best player but has ideas has yes. really strong ideas mm -hmm. so that takes a lot of the experimentation that the machine can predict and get to but there's a different thing that man has that the machines don't it's an intuitiveness yes and intuitive Intuition and prediction are two different things. And so the machine can do give you a bunch of predictive equations, for examples, of changes you might like or things you might want to do and make some really very interesting suggestions. Mm -hmm. But it's predictive and it's pretty much based on like not even random, but just like different variations. Mm -hmm. Whereas intuition is like, no, go completely left. Mm -hmm. How much do you rely on technology? Like, uh, are you attached to certain instruments or certain technology? I think I'm like pretty much porous at this point. Like, I'm just open, you mm -hmm. know. I like the way I work at the moment, but I'm, I'm like open to yeah. new methods. When you first started making music, you went from seeming like a hip hop fan <laughs> into what's the first thing you ever made, regardless of whether you put it out or not. What was your first experiments in making your own music? We, Chad and I, um, and, I and I haven't mentioned Chad yet, but because I think you asked me a lot of questions in reference to my own personal process. Yeah. But for a very big part of my career, Chad and I worked together. Mm -hmm. And I think what we tried to do um, and we still work together. Yeah. Um, but I think for the most part, what we always tried to do was reverse engineer the songs that did something to us emotionally and figure out where the mechanism is in there. And as I said to you before, try to fi figure out if we can build a building that doesn't look the same, but makes you feel the same way. Yeah. I did that in Blurred Lines and got myself in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, it, it, ridiculously Stevie Wonder told me he said you gotta get the right musicologist in there because juries don't understand it's very technical what you've done yeah and it's the song is nothing like the song nope but the feeling was yeah but the feeling is and not something what, that you can copyright no, you can't copyright a feeling. No. All salsa songs sound pretty much the same. Yes, and reggae songs or any genre. 100%. Trap music sounds relatively similar. Yeah, but here's the difference. Yeah. What we failed, and it hurt my feelings because yeah. I would never take anything from anyone. Of course. Um, and that really set me back. I made Missy Elliott's Where They From in the middle of that trial. But I was really hurt because what I realized all too late was what he was trying to tell me is I needed to use what it use my gift to make music to reverse engineer the 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 disparity between the truth and people's 
um, and the jury's uneducated um, opinions. And I say that because Rayon and Silk feel the same, but we understand that there's a clear difference. Yeah. And that was what, what happened. Yeah. Like I really made it feel so much like it yeah. that people were like, oh, I hear the same thing. Yeah. And it's like, no, nah. yeah. look at the notes. Yeah. Well, if you, if you don't know, yeah. then, you know, when you get like, you know, an ambulance chaser, which is who they got. Yeah. This guy never won. In, like, let me not speak um, negatively about them. This was my lesson. Yeah. I didn't take Stevie's advice um, to the fullest extent. I did. I thought I was. Yeah. But I didn't. I I really underestimated people and not not getting that. Yeah. Well, the the issue is it. It's bad for mu- it's bad for music mm-hmm. because we've we've had an understanding of what a song is, and now based on that one case, now there's a question: what a song is? Yeah. It's not what it used to be because in the past it would be the chords the melody Mm -hmm. and the words would be the song Mm -hmm. and your chords, your melody and your words, none of them had anything to do. Nope. So it, it It was just a feeling, but I'd often see what it leaves you in a, it leaves us as music makers in a really uh, uncomfortable place making things because now we don't know what you can do. I failed you. (laughs) I did. I left it up to what I thought would be, you know, what was right. Yeah. But I was wrong because I didn't go the extra mile to get people to understand. You can't, you can cop, you can copyright that which is tangible. Yes. Not the intangible. Yes. And that's what they proved. Yes. Because I had the ability to make something feel very similar. Yes. They said, you know what? This is wrong. If it feels like it, that's what it is. Well, you can't copyright a feeling because if that's the case, there will be a lot of marijuana cases right now, right? Yeah. Well, this weed makes me feel this way yes. and this weed makes me feel this way. It's the same. Copywriting feeling, Yeah. right? So yeah. that means that like, if you make chocolate and somebody else makes chocolate and both of them makes someone feel a certain kind of way, they can now sue you. Be an interesting documentary for you to make about just about this. Copyright. Just to explain just to explain to people how it works, what you did, what the what the rules historically have been, mm-hmm. and what impact this uh, this decision has on the history of music. Mm-hmm. Because if you, I mean, everything is rooted in something, everything. That one, that one hurt me. That one set me back. That one, like, that hurt. Well, everyone was shocked by it. Of course. Anyone who knows about, who knows, who understands the situation would be shocked by it because what you did was completely what has been done since the beginning of people making music. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine all the people who made Motown-esque music? Everyone. You know? Yes. Everybody that makes merengue. Yes. Everybody that makes jazz. Yeah. Oh, that's swinging. Hey. I wonder if this is interesting. I, I never really made this connection before, but I wonder if this in any way plays into the the new way our culture is looking back on material. Like I I was at a dinner the other night and um, someone mentioned that Richard Pryor wouldn't be able to put out the material that he put out today. Mm -hmm. 
And Richard Pryor was, you know, one of the great, all-time greats. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if there's this, like, uh, if the line of what's possible, instead of it being this ever-expanding growth mm -hmm. of making more beautiful, interesting things, the powers that be may be very much like in the beginning, beginning, beginning days of hip-hop are trying to constrict that that opening of what's possible to share. I mean, there's a, there's a, yeah. I think there's, I think there's always that anyways. I mean, I think that's the country we live in. That's the world we live in. There's always a bunch of, you know, older folks who are in positions of power who don't think as progressively as the the younger generation and seek to hold things and keep try to keep things as yesterday when we already know it's already for tomorrow i mean i don't think that he could do that kind of um i don't think that he could do it now i don't think richard could do it now i think he's amazing he's to me he's the goat hmm. he's the like the greatest of all time to me yeah of all time. Yeah. But I don't think you could because um, the poles have shifted already. And when the poles shift, everything in the matrix is just a new, new, it's a new color, it's a new taste, it's the new smell, it's a new feeling, and the rules change. If you go back and look at half the commercials that were like out in the seventies, like they are incredibly disrespectful to women, mm. like incredibly. And so he made, his jokes were created in, at a time when the zeitgeist was progressive for that time. Mm -hmm. But then when you look over your shoulder, you realize that even in, you know, the need to progress was still so much super wrong shit. I mean, like, LGBTQIA where they were like really not even allowed to exist with the exception of being mocked as men cross-dressing for a joke yeah. or cross-dressing for a show. Other than that, that just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, it was okay to call them names and be incredibly disrespectful to people's feelings that would never that would never fly but he yeah. I mean if you really know his life story like I mean he didn't have anything against anyone no of and course. maybe and maybe he could have for yeah. that reason yeah but the language that he used was because it was pushing it for that time yes it was of the moment you can't you can't you, you can't take art out of the context in which it was made. Yeah. And art is expression. And the art of art, you know, the power of art, what gives art its pertinence is when people are pushing it. Yeah. He would be pushing it in a completely different, different way right yeah, now. But, but the world was a different place. So he would be pushing it maybe in the same way, but it would feel completely different in today's world because the world's different. Yeah. So the context would change everything. Yes. But he would, it would be the same velocity yes. of power. The same degree. Probably just different jokes. 100%. Yeah. Since, since the Blurred Lines issue, it's interesting, I wasn't even going to bring it up. But since, since, uh, since you well, brought- Well, because we were talking about feeling, yeah, and I know, yeah. that's my, that, I know that's what the universe has I, given me. So One of the things has, it's given me is like the ability to, is to make things, is to reverse engineer a feeling yes. and make a tangible item. So since what happened happened, has it changed anything about the way you work? No. Good. This is the only way I know how to make. Great. Yeah. That's great news. Yeah. I just know I need to be incredibly, when something feels super, no matter if the chords are absolutely, like they're jazz chords. Yeah. And, and what I am seeking to match the feeling in is like 
80s power power band chords I still reach out hey you guys just want to be clear this feels the same to me yeah but it's not yeah yeah here's this here's this here's this here's this how do you feel about this you know yeah. just having those kinds of conversations if, if someone is just like completely outlandish about something I'm like alright I'm cool on you like whatever which never happens this was just like a freak situation absolutely that was meant to humble me mm. to teach me a lesson yeah um and I think that lesson was just be very clear in what my um, intentions are and to just not assume that everybody understands the difference, dif difference between Rayon and Silk. Yeah. So, I made Rayon. Yes. He made Silk. Yes. Sometimes you want Rayon. Yeah. Depends what, depends on the use. Yeah. There's, there's a reason Rayon exists. 100%. <laughs> um, what's the most fun or exciting moment for you in the process? When you make something and you're like, yeah, I got to play this again. You know? Yeah. Only a couple times in my career I made something like that. Where me and my wife, we just play it over and over and over. We go on a ride. Yeah. And we'll look up and we've been driving for like 45 minutes wow. to an hour. A couple times. It's a great feeling. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I love the moment when we're working in the studio patiently, you know, waiting for something to happen. Yeah. And something goes from not so interesting to really interesting and not much changed. Yeah. And it's like, what just ha like what happened yeah what just happened and um and it's a little scary that feeling of like didn't like do nobody much. move yeah it's very exciting and it, and it's so um it's so out of our control you know can't make that happen no it's just patience no i don't think we make we don't make much happen no. when it comes to creativity we're yeah. just we're just antennas and transistors yes we're speakers you know we're just lucky to get the transmission yeah when did your uh interest in fashion begin oh ever since i realized i didn't have it <laughs> when i was young and my other friends would come to class with like Jordans and all these other things. I would always say, man, I, if I get those, man, I would like see those in green, you know? And so when given an opportunity, I just started like doing it just because I was so appreciative to be able to do it. Do you see it as the same as making music? Making? Yeah. 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 Same, it's the same. Um, You're using the same muscles. Same process. Yeah. yeah. Definitely using the same muscles. Yeah. Anything else you'd be interested in applying those muscles to that you haven't yet? Well, first of all, like the one thing that's definitely on my mind before I leave is that we have to do something together. You don't need me. <laughs> I definitely need you. I'm not sure for what yet. I don't know what you're working on, but um, I mean, I'm so down. You're like, we'll find something important to do together. I would be so honored. You talked about you and Chad starting together, making music. How would you say the process of making music has changed from before doing anything, starting as a kid, being a fan, making music, till now? What's changed? I guess being a family man, you know, more, than, more of a family man than I ever was. 
I always said that I was going to have like four kids. I didn't know I was really going to have four kids. I always said it. Yeah. And we went from one to four. Incredible. That's the only difference. I love music. Music is like, music is the, is the key that's open, you know, it's the skeleton key that's open every door for me, including this one right here. Um, who knew on the other side of chord structures that would make me emotional as a child would lead to this moment right here. I go on the other side of listening to, you know, Q-tip sampling Roy Ayers music productions, Daylight to make Bonita Apple Bum on the other side of my infatuation with that song and listening to it over and over again on repeat on the other side of that, of those chords, was the distance to this moment. Nothing's changed. All built on music. 100%. The mountain of song. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, we're very lucky that this, that we get to play in this world so much. Yeah. I mean, I want this for everybody. I want everybody to wake up every day going, how did I, how did this happen? I love doing this. Yeah. I feel like I get paid for free. So I'm doing what I love to do. I want that for everybody. This is, this place is amazing. This interview was, you know, awesome. Just so grateful, so grateful for this opportunity to be able to sit with you and that's like I'm to me that's how awesome the universe is. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. We are blessed. Like I got a chance to sit and talk to you. The unit like the universe works it out that way. Like you're doing one thing, okay. And you're also gonna sit down and have this conversation with Rick Rubin. Thank you for making the long journey out here. They're trying to silence the voices of hip hop. <laughs> They're at it again. Thank you. 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 Thank you.